Support comes from New York State United Teachers, a union of professionals standing with more than 600,000 workers in education, human services, and health care with the Our Voice, Our Values, Our Union campaign. And United University Professions, representing 37,000 academic and professional employees at SUNY campuses and teaching hospitals across New York State. Frederick E. Cole, President, UUPinfo.org. It's the Capital Connection. Hi, I'm Alan Chartok. Joining us today is State Senator James Skoufis, a Democrat from New York's 39th Senate District, which includes Newburgh. Senator Skoufis is chair of the Senate Committee on Investigations and Government Operations. Welcome back, Senator, and congratulations. I understand you have a little baby named Ava Rose with your wife, Hillary. So uh, congratulations. I know that you won't be getting much sleep for a while. Thanks very much, Alan. And that's what everyone says. And apparently it's not temporary. I'm told it lasts a solid 18 plus years, the sleep <laughs> deprivation. But I'm happy to be on the show. I actually got a decent night's sleep last night uh, just for you. And I hope you've been well uh, since we last connected. Indeed, I have. And I must say, I don't want to take any credit for doing what my wonderful wife, Roselle, did because she made sure that those kids were well taken care of in the middle of the night. Okay, the session's now done. Talk to us about criminal justice reforms. For example, the Clean Slate legislation. So the Clean Slate bill... I look like it was coming together towards the end of session, uh, but like I, it, things occasionally happen at the end of session, it sort of unraveled. And uh, in this case, you know, the, the bill for, for your listeners, the bill would have effectively uh, I set an automatic trigger to seal uh, most uh, criminal convictions after a certain number of years once someone had served their time. Uh, it's a controversial bill. Uh, there were some technical issues that were found towards the end. And then, you know, as, uh, as folks were trying to iron those technical issues out, uh, we sort of just ran out of time uh, and we gaveled out of session. I, I expect that the issue will resurface uh, when we return to session, uh, whether that be in January, uh, in all likelihood January, but maybe sooner if, if you know, there's a, a pressing reason to come back uh, in emergency session. But, uh, but you know, that's, that's one issue that, uh, that I think disappointed advocates. But I will say that, look, you know, it's, it's easy to hang your hat on disappointment, especially when something unravels towards the very end of session. But let's not lose sight of the fact that there were some really significant, enormous uh, progressive accomplishments uh, during the uh, legislative session this year, not the least of which was the budget, where we finally uh, are on track to fully fund our public schools, and we finally are on track to fund pre-K outside of New York City, which was a big win that I was pushing for for years. Uh, we, uh, we legalized uh, recreational adult use marijuana, which is a criminal justice issue. It's a fairness issue. Uh, it's an issue that just, just makes a lot of sense, in my opinion. But we, we had a lot of uh, significant victories this year. But, you know, there's always more work to do. Let's go back, if we can, to the clean slate legislation. We understand what you're trying to get at here. You're trying to say, OK, somebody shouldn't have to walk around for the rest of their life with this thing hanging around their, their necks. But if somebody's going to employ somebody else, isn't this relevant that somebody may have had a criminal record? That is the balance that we need to strike. And I think that is the balance that up until the very last moments we were trying to, to, to work out with the assembly and with the governor. When we got to the very end, we needed to uh, engage with the governor because uh, we would have needed a message of necessity uh, given the timing uh, was, was, was running short uh, to pass the bill. And so, uh, so yes, that is the balance. You, you don't want... Uh, you, know, you don't want a long-in-the-past conviction to prevent someone who served their time and is now out of, of prison from being able to find employment and get their life back and be able to be a productive member of society. Uh, we want to be able to give that kind of uh, person who, who paid restitution uh, the, the ability to get their feet back under them. On the other hand, 
especially if a conviction is relevant to the employment or the employment is uh, very sensitive. For example, you know, the, the employment uh, involves being around children. Uh, there needs to be an ability for that employer to, to know and understand uh, what happened in that person's past. And so that is the balance that we need to strike and, and that we were trying to strike and that I hope uh, we'll continue to try and uh, strike when we revisit this. Now, with the uptick in gun violence around the state, it's featured prominently, I think, in the New York City mayoral race. And many in the Republican Party and law enforcement, including the DA David Soar, is a Democrat, says that it be laid at the feet of bail reform. Now, can you explain to us about bail reform? I think a lot of people still don't know about it. My own personal view is, for whatever it's worth, Eric Adams became the number one candidate because criminal justice became so important. People were afraid. So there's that. And then the question of bail reform, which some people think is not a great idea. Well, first of all, let's talk about bail reform. Why don't you tell us what it is? So the whole point of bail reform uh, was to attempt to try and take uh, economic discrimination, which often is tied to racial discrimination, out of the criminal justice system, where someone who is arrested for an alleged crime before they stand trial, before they're found innocent or guilty, uh, they appear in court. And for many crimes, a judge will set bail. If you can afford to post that bail, you wait for your trial in the comfort of your own home. If you cannot afford to post that bail, you wait for the trial in the discomfort of a jail cell. And so the the whole point of bail reform was to try and break down that uh, that. You know, sort of economic divide uh, that was treating some folks uh, very differently than others in our criminal justice system in the pretrial sense. Now, now look, you know, there were there were issues, uh, in some cases, significant issues with the original version of bail reform that passed in the 2019 budget that we had to revisit in 2022. That I supported revisiting in, uh, sorry, 2020. Uh, that we did revisit and that we did pass and address. For example. Uh, one flaw, I believe, in the original version is that uh, we, we did not allow uh, judges to set bail for repeat offenders in many cases. And, you know, if someone is, uh, is arrested for burglary, which is different than robbery in the sense that there's no firearm, there's no weapon involved, but if someone's arrested for burglary uh, and there's no bail set, but then they go out and get arrested the next day for burglary again – I think most people would agree that bail should be set now for that repeat offense. There becomes an expectation in society that uh, repeat offenders, uh, you know, pose a risk to uh, to society and potentially uh, property and and livelihood uh, of of folks in society. So that was one of the big fixes that we made uh, in 2020 after we revisited the issue. But that that's the fundamental point of bail reform. Now let me talk about gun violence and sure. any connection here. So so let's be clear uh, that there are a number of violent crimes that are up nationally. This isn't a New York City issue. This isn't a New York State issue. And in fact, New York City, if you just want to talk about New York City, because that's oftentimes where there's the microscope, uh, New York City beats the national average in assaults year over year. We actually had a drop of 0.3% to the national average of an increase of 4.6%. New York City beat the national average in uh, reduction in rape crimes minus 21% to minus 17.8%. New York City beat the national average in robberies and larcenies. There are some crimes that New York City did worse than the national average on, and that includes homicides and burglaries and auto crimes. And so what I'm trying to say here is that uh, this isn't black and white. This isn't clear cut. There's not a clear uh, causation here between reforms of the criminal justice system that happened specifically here in New York and any increase uh, in crimes uh, that are happening in New York City or New York State. If, you know, the floodgates just opened because of criminal justice reforms in New York, then we wouldn't be seeing 
us beating the national average on a whole host of uh, crimes, some of which are violent. We There's talk- no doubt in my mind that Eric Adams did well this past Tuesday uh, in the primary in New York City because of the issue of public safety. Uh, And there's no doubt, given his background as a former cop, there's no doubt, uh, in my mind, given his just personal background as an African-American man uh, who can speak to both public safety and criminal justice reform as someone who has been affected uh, by over-policing himself, I think that is how he broke through. There's no doubt about it. And this isn't a uh, Republican-only issue or a non-Democratic-only issue. There is a significant, I would argue, majority of the Democratic Party that does have a keen focus and wants to uh, see elected officials take care of public safety. That's the issue that he spoke to. We are talking to State Senator James Skoufis, a Democrat from New York's 39th District. Let me go on to this. I completely agree with you. I think Eric Adams got the most votes. We don't know if he won yet as we speak, but we do know he got the most votes. Largely, I believe, on the fact that he was a former cop. Now, cops are in some disrepute these days. And it does seem to me that as we got towards the mayoral election in New York, things really changed. I mean, everybody was after the police, not everybody, but a lot of people. Let's reform them. Let's fire them. Let's do this and that. But now we see that people want police. Now, with the recent developments, a cop leaning on a guy's neck, there was a a lot of problems with police. Do you think things have changed substantially? I hope things have changed at least some. You know, since George Floyd, we've taken a number of steps, as, as you know and your listeners know, here in New York, as it relates to trying to, and this is what I focus on, trying to hold bad cops accountable. I think the large, I know, the large majority of police officers that I represent, and I have, a, I have two layers of it in my district. I have people who are local cops in the villages, towns, and the city of Newburgh uh, that I serve, and then a ton of NYPD cops who commute from my district uh, into New York City. And so the large majority, I believe, and I know of cops are good hearted people who are in it for the right reasons and they want to protect their community. But can't we all agree that bad cops need to be rooted out and held accountable? Yep. Clearly, I guess we can't all agree, but I think the large, uh, the vast majority of the public uh, ought to be able to agree with that and the majority of cops. The issue is you've got politics involved. Uh, you've got you know, people who dig in their trenches and try and you know, uh, offer up uh, policy solutions through bumper sticker slogans and demonize the other side. And, and that's where you get this division that exists. But the matter of fact is all we're talking about here, all I'm talking about at least, is let's ferret out the bad ones. We hold them accountable and make sure that we, we work to restore the public trust that is frayed in a lot of these communities. And so I hope that it's gotten better some over the past two years. Now, we know that there are police who live in your district, and a lot of people are going around saying police should have to live where they are being policemen. Is that right? So there are folks who who say that there is legislation that speaks to that. And I, I'll be frank, I do have some concerns uh, with uh, with that legislation. Um, let me let me uh, let me explain. So I, I, I just take exception to the suggestion that somehow a NYPD cop who lives in Rockland County in the district I represent is somehow incapable or insensitive to policing in, let's say, Harlem. Whereas someone from Bay Ridge, a white cop in Bay Ridge, who happens to live in New York City, but basically the same distance from Harlem as Rockland County, they're okay policing in uh, any part of of New York City, central Brooklyn or Bronx or Manhattan, wherever it might be. And so I I do take exception uh, to to that suggestion. Uh, should, Should I be out there talking about how, well, you can only teach in my district If you live in my Senate district, because you obviously care about kids in our classroom more than someone who might come from New York City across the river or further upstate. I I think it's a dangerous road to go down where we put up these walls. Uh, You know, New Jersey tried this a number of years ago where they basically passed a law through the legislature that stated you have to live in New Jersey to be just about any type of public employee in New Jersey, including teachers. My county's border, New Jersey. And we took great offense 
to the fact that you can't live in my district and teach in, in northern New Jersey. Should we have passed a retaliatory law that said you have to live in New York to teach in New York? Starting to go down that road and putting up walls around villages and towns and cities and states, that becomes, I think, highly problematic and very counterproductive. So I want to switch subjects to one which I think you have great concerns about, Senator Scoofus, and that is the governor of New York. A lot of people feel, you know, he's had enough. Some of the polls say we want somebody new. I know that many charges are being bandied about against him. And I'm wondering what your latest thinking is on this. So the latest is, you know, I, I maintain the position that that I shared months ago at this point. I was one of the first Democrats in the state Senate to come out and call on the governor to, to step down. And look, I, I think that it's important that we turn the page here at the end of the day. And the, the, the next shoe to drop, I think, is likely the attorney general's report. Then uh, I suspect after that we'll, we'll hear from the assembly's investigation. Uh, and you know, so perhaps – uh, perhaps this issue, uh, these issues surrounding the governor and uh, and his office will be revisited in a very high profile front of mind way uh, for anyone who uh, has not been focused on them uh, for the last couple of months. But uh, but look, you know, I, I think it's uh, it's important that we have a governor that is able to fully focus without distraction uh, on the the countless issues coming out of the pandemic. We'll have another session starting in January. Uh, be able to fully focus on those issues. And, and right now, you have so many allegations. Uh, they're so troubling. And uh, so I you know I have the same position now that I did uh, back in March when I came out and called for resignation. So let me ask you this: This is a guy, Governor. Cuomo, who has a reputation for not taking prisoners. And I have written in my columns, you know, people like you who have done what you consider to be the right thing should sleep with the lights on. Not that you're sleeping with a new baby. But do you worry about that, about retribution? I don't. I mean, you know, I, I think anyone would be lying if they told you it never crossed their mind. Uh, but, but look, you know, I... I, I'm a prof- I like to think of myself as a professional here. I'm able to, to do what I consider to be the right thing. Uh, in this case, you know, calling on the, the governor to step down while still be able to you know, operate as a professional. So assuming the assembly drops the ball and doesn't go forward and assuming these investigations amount to little or nothing and assuming he runs again, which I think he's going to do, uh, he's collecting a lot of money to do that. Do you see anybody, you're the Democrat legislator, do you see anybody who could run against him? I think there are certainly people who would uh, line up the primary. Look, you know, without the scandals that are ongoing right now, the governor's had primary challenges the past two cycles. And so, look, I don't know what the governor's going to do if he makes it to next year in, in the governor's mansion and we get to petition season and we're talking about election and re-election. I don't know what he's going to do. That's ultimately a decision for him uh, if we get that far. But I do think that there's a strong sense I think just about everyone in the Democratic conference in the Senate has called for resignation. And so it's pretty clear to me that the overriding uh, sense is that we're interested in turning the page here. And so I don't know what he's going to do, but I would expect that there would be, just given the last two times out there were primary challenges, I would expect there to be a very serious primary challenge or challenges, whether he runs or doesn't run next year. And so we'll we'll see what happens. But I, I think most of the legislature wants to turn the page. Okay. Your committee has taken the lead in the sexual harassment investigations even before the governor's trouble came to light. Where do we have to go to make this right? So that's right. Back in 2019, I co-chaired with Senators Biagi and Salazar, uh, really, you know, first of its kind hearings on sexual harassment here in New York State. In fact, one of the hearings went so long, we went past midnight. Uh, we heard so much testimony. And so this is an issue that the Senate uh, and I uh, have been uh, very interested in, uh, especially sexual harassment in the workplace. And we have passed a host of bills uh, under, in particular, Senator Biagi's leadership. Uh, And uh, and so I think we've made some significant strides. There's no doubt that there is still more work to do. Uh, You know, one one issue that uh, we didn't get resolution on before ending session, the Senate passed it, but we couldn't get it across the finish line, was the uh, Adult Survivors Act which would open up a window for people to get uh, legal recourse, similar to uh, how we did for the Child Victims Act 
uh, a number of years ago, uh, people who you know missed their uh, timely opportunity uh, under the legal system to, to get recourse against uh, their perpetrators, we would give them that new opportunity again. So there's more work to do, but we have taken uh, a significant interest in this issue well before, you're right, the recent allegations against the governor. So why didn't the Adult Survivors Act pass in the Assembly when it was unanimously passed in your house? That sounds like a wonderful question for the next assembly member that you have on your show. Uh, I, I, I'm i not interested in speculating as to what the assembly's motives or problems were on this bill. I have I've respect for Speaker Hasty, uh, and so I'm, I'm not going to go down that road. But, you know, that's a, that's a fair question that you should ask the next assembly member that comes on. Well, let me just persist in it for a moment. Do you think it's lining up that, as you said before, the Democratic members of the New York State Senate have a problem with Cuomo and the allegations against him, and maybe that Speaker Hasty may be running a little interference for him? I would not characterize it that way. I, look, you know, the Assembly plays a different role than the Senate does in these types of proceedings, just like the House does uh, versus the Senate in, in Washington. They start the impeachment proceedings. And so I was at the time I was glad to see that they launched a formal investigation into uh, impeachment. They could have just went out there and said, well, we're just going to look at investigate uh, the allegations. But they specifically said this is an impeachment investigation. Now, I will say my my hope at the time was that this would be a weeks long or maybe a month or two long uh, investigation uh, and not a many, many, many months long investigation. And so I hope that uh, it does not drag on for, for too much longer. But that's the assembly's business. And uh, I'd like to think and I know Carl Hasty well enough uh, to, to trust that this is not uh, interference. Um, but uh, but I do hope that they're able to, to tie this up sooner rather than later. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about redistricting. It's fascinating to me. I've been around for a long time, and I have watched, you know, the idea that because of 89 people who didn't show up at their doors, the census people, I think, messed up. And as a result, we lost a congressman in New York State. And now you guys have got to get together with the Assembly and decide which congressman goes, which district goes, and which stays. Can you fill us in on where you, what your thinking is? I have no idea. Your guess is as good as mine uh, which district is going to go or which district is going to merge. Uh, now, look, you know, it stands to reason that a disproportionate amount of the population loss uh, in New York or the lack of growth, uh, maybe is a better way to put it, has been in far upstate New York. Yeah. And so, you know, just uh, by that metric alone, which really ought to be the driving metric, I expect that the merged or the lost seat will come from, uh, you know, central New York, upstate New York, north country, uh, somewhere parts north. Um, But beyond that, you know, your guess is as good as mine. As you know, uh, we don't even have the district level data census data yet. Uh, Typically, we would have had that for months at this point, uh, but because of the Trump administration's handling of the census, we're not due to get that district-level census data to put together maps for still a number of months from now. Uh, and so, uh, so that's, that's you know, sort of my thinking uh, on where we are and where I think we might land on uh, that congressional seat. Well, we're hearing that former Congressman Brindisi is not running again. Many people think that that's the tip off James Goofus, that that is the reason he's saying that, because that district is the one that's going to go. There's a question. I have there. no idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anthony Brindisi is a former colleague of mine in the Assembly. He was a great congressman for the term that he served. I hope he does run again. I, I think he'd, he, he'd make uh, an excellent uh, uh, congressman again, uh, heading back to Washington and being part of the New York delegation. I have no idea. I haven't spoken to him on what his intentions are. Perhaps he has a little bit more insight than I do. Perhaps you have a little bit more insight than I do. Not me. <laughs> But I do expect that there's going to be a focus on uh, the upstate seats. But beyond that, I, I don't have any more information. So let me ask you something. Go back to the Cuomo investigation. I'm fascinated by where his vulnerabilities are. Do you think that the number one vulnerability is the handling of the COVID nursing home death numbers? I don't know that I'm prepared to rank 
vulnerabilities, but there's no doubt that the handling of the nursing home issue is problematic for the governor. I do think for a lot of people, uh, the sexual harassment allegations are severe and really, really troublesome. You know, so I, I don't know which one is more a vulnerability than the other. There are, of course, other vulnerabilities as well. He's long been criticized from the left flank of the party for a whole host of reasons. I think that doesn't go away. Uh, the question is, you know, these, these newer vulnerabilities, to what extent do they compound uh, that exposure that already existed. Uh, and so, you know, look, I, I hope this doesn't turn out to be, uh, you know, whether he runs again or not, uh, who primaries, who doesn't primary. I hope that doesn't come down to be a matter of polling and a political decision. Uh, I hope that there's an understanding that once we get to next year or leading into next year's election, that it's just the right thing to do for New York state government, for the public in New York, the voting public, that we have a new governor and we turn the page on uh, everything that's gone on over the past number of months. Okay, James Kufus. In the budget negotiations, a lot of people predicted that because of all of his problems right now, he would be less of a force. Does it turn out that way, or was he able to hold his own? Look, I don't think I'm speaking out of school in saying that, yes, you know, he was less of a force in budget negotiations. Uh, and, I, you know, I, I think that's not even just a, a matter of, um, you know, what happened in private negotiations. Just look at what typically happens in public uh, during budget time and the governor. Every year, in the nine years I've been in the state legislature, uh, he would be out there saying, I am not signing a budget unless this is in there. Uh, and I am not signing a budget if this is uh, included. And he'd be making these very public line in the sand pronouncements uh, you know, as part of his posturing uh, with the legislature. And make no mistake, as you know, the governor has tremendous disproportionate power, constitutional power during budget negotiations. We did not see those public lines in the sand uh, this year. And it's because I, I think it's obvious he was dealing with these other issues. And so, so look, you know, there were increased taxes on millionaires as part of this budget, something that we all know, I think, is public knowledge. The governor's never been a big fan of. No. Uh, there was, there were, you know, significant, the biggest increase in school aid uh, that uh, that we've ever seen. The governor's never really been a big fan of, you know, increases of that size. And so, so I think the answer to your question is yes. I think it's it's fair to say that uh, that his his negotiating power was diminished somewhat this year. We're out of time, and I'm so sorry about that because I could talk to State Senator James Kufus for an another hour. Senator Skoufis, brand new papa, we are so proud that you came on and saw fit to see us today. Thanks so much for joining us. Absolutely my delight, as always. Thank you, Alan.